Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Richard Skipper celebrates the best in entertainment. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique, never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Thursday, everyone. What are you celebrating? For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. My show is all about celebrating, celebrating life, celebrating art, celebrating artists, celebrating people. There's a lot to celebrate if you only take the time to do so. Three years ago today, I was doing a show called Richard Skipper Celebrates, but it was a live show here in, here in New York. Uh, here's my mug, all about that. And if you look very closely, uh, Avery Summers was in that show. Now, I asked Avery to do the show totally not realizing that it was three years ago today that I did this show. And then this morning, I go on Facebook, and it pops up in my feed in the memory section that it was three years ago today that we did this show talk about synchronicity. Now, I want to say a few words before we begin to talk with Avery. If this is your first time here, I hope that you all have a wonderful time. We have a lot to celebrate. We just have to take the time to do so. And here is a woman who has a lot to celebrate. And I want to ask you, Avery, before we start, what are you celebrating today? Wow, Richard, hi. I am thrilled, <laughs> first of all, to be here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I am celebrating life, and I know that that sounds really sort of made up, but it's not. I'm celebrating life for many reasons. I am one of four siblings, and they're all gone except me. Mm. And I'm celebrating myself for having been through a lot of phases and stages in my life, and I've come out on this end, and I'm strong, and I'm capable, and I'm here. And that makes me very, very happy. So I'm celebrating myself. Well, there is a lot to celebrate there. I mean, if you look at your resume and your bio, um, it's like reading the Gideon's Bible. It's so <laughs> huge with so much that you have put into this Bible. I want to, first of all, give a shout out to, uh, let's start with a few people that we both can celebrate. Michael Mashey. Uh, I met Michael, um, you know, by happenstance a few years ago. And Michael happened to be uh, performing at Ben Woman's Bar uh, here in New York at the Carlisle. And he invited us to come in. And as I walked in, I hear this phenomenal voice uh, that was not a human voice. It was a voice of an angel. And that was you. And wow. I went up and I immediately asked for your card. And I told you about this series that I was doing. And yes. I said, if you're going to be coming back to New York, I want you in the show. And you said, well, I have no plans to be in New York. But if I'm going to be in New York, I will call you. And you did. And you were in the show. Um, how did you and Michael meet? And what brought you to New York at that time? I met Michael in, in West Palm Beach, actually at the um, Colony Hotel. He was working there. Uh, and I'll also take you back a little bit. Rob Russell was the head of the theater there because nobody knew about that place until he took it, turned it around, and made it a destination for cabaret performers. So Michael was playing there, and one night I walked in, and and he introduced him to me. 
Uh, Michael said that he was going to Bimmelman's, and if I was in New York, if I just happened to find myself there, uh, he would um, play for me and I would sing there. So I did that night, and you walked in. I, saw, I remember talking with you about it and everything. So it was really, you know, there again, it was synchronicity, I believe. You know, I believe in that very much. Absolutely. So, and I said, you've got to do a show in New York. Yes. And then you called me a few weeks later. Do you recall the conversation you and I had? Well, I think it was that I was going to be doing the cabaret convention. Is that what it was? I no, the cabaret that, convention had not. Come, I don't think the cabaret, I could be mistaken. Okay. Uh, but I think at this point that you wanted to do a show in New York at this point. Uh, but you said it had been a while since you had done anything in New York. Oh, yes. Okay. And, yes. Yes. Am I right? Yes. That's and correct. you didn't know where to start. And right. I said, well, just leave everything to me. <laughs> I know. I, I, and you I, know. you know, and I immediately called the Laurie Beachman Theater. Yes. And I got great. you a booking yes. um, before anything. And then I said, who would you like to play for you? And this will be the next person that we're going to celebrate, Dana P. Rowe. That's right. Um, and you picked Dana P. Rowe as your musical director, who has since become an incredible friend of mine. So you picked Dana P. Rowe. How did you and Dana meet? Dana and I met here in South Florida when I was doing a cut. We go way back. And, and we talked about this a few weeks ago. But... Um, Dana plays for just everybody, and he's an amazing musician. And um, Dana and I did a show called But Not For Me, which was my first one-woman show that I worked with him on at the Caldwell Theater in Boca Raton, which is now the Wick Theater. So mm -hmm. it's gone through many lives as well. But uh, Dana was my musical director. But we go further back than that. And we'll talk about that another time. And uh, so when I go to New York, whenever I'm working there, Dana is my first call because we have amazing history together. So it's wonderful. So we put the band together. Yes. Uh, you did the show. The yes. show was a huge hit. And you were asked to do the cabaret convention. Yes. Um, and you had done the cabaret convention uh, many years before, am I correct? That's right. That's right. I I did the cabaret convention when it was, uh, gosh, it was a tiny little theater. And honestly, you may remember better than I, but it was a, a um, it was on I believe Forty Second Street or maybe Forty First Street or something. It was it mm -hmm. was town hall, a town hall at town hall, and oh my God, I I was doing showboat at the time. And Donald, bless his heart, um, asked me to be a part Donald of Smith. the cabaret convention. I met Julie Wilson, for God's sake, and, and, and Jeff Harner. And I mean, amazing singers, performers, musicians. It was just an incredible time in my life. Absolutely incredible. And so here are these many years later, you were asked to be, you know, in the cabaret convention again. And yes. I will tell everyone who was there knows this. You killed, which oh. is not a surprise because that's normally uh, what happens when you hit a stage. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, you know, and we have another mutual friend, uh, Tess LaBella. Yes. Uh, how did you and Tess meet? Oh, well, I was doing a, sh a um, concert at an amphitheater here in West Palm Beach, and a friend of mine um, brought her that day. And I, I saw this lady with this glow around her of white hair. <laughs> and when I came off stage, my friend said, I want you to meet Tess LaBella. And a couple of other people were there. Rob Russell was there. And we've just remained and have gotten closer and closer and closer. And I am just thrilled about that because she's one of the best people you'll ever want to know. Trust me on that. And I will let everyone know, full disclosure, uh, Tess does the voiceover that you hear at the beginning of my program. And I love her. Every morning, we begin the day by sending positive messages to each other. We text yeah. each other and we start every day that way. And she's just absolutely the best. So now let's go a little bit down memory lane. 
Oh, okay. um, I want to talk a little bit about the household and the family that you grew up in. Um, did you grow up in a musical household? Well, I grew up not in our immediate household, but extended family members. My mother, I'll just point this out. My mother was one of 13 children, and I think at wow. that time, people had big families. My mom's the oldest of 16. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so the brother who was just ahead of her was one of those that played by ear. He didn't read music, but you put you could sing a few bars of anything and he could play it, you know. And so it was that kind of feeling. And I grew up in a Baptist church, which was not the foot stomping, the tambourine clapping, but I'm telling you, rousing, go get them kind of music. And uh, and that's my feeling right now when I sing. And, I, and I've learned that that's what I bring to the table. I didn't know what it was that people would appreciate about my music mm -hmm. until I got older, really, and began to understand that it was my background, my Bible thumping background, because I had... Uh, an uncle who was a Bible thumper and my grandfather who was a Bible thumper and they thumped all around. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you grow up in a religious household? Yes, yes, pretty much. I mean, my dad would always say, I am not going out to that church and let them send my soul to hell, but he believed in God. Do you understand? Because it was exactly. the politics of it all. My mother was the one that said, you get up and you go to church and you get up and you get dressed and you go to church. You could go out on Saturday night and stay till five o'clock in the morning, but at nine o'clock, you're going to church. You know, Ain't so. nobody's business if I do, as the lyrics go. go. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I asked this question because I want to know if you grew up in a, uh, in a household, were you allowed to listen to pop music? Did you have uh, record albums? And if so, who were the singers that you grew up listening to and who did you want to emulate? Were there role models that you wanted to listen to and who were the people that you were singing along with uh, as you were listening to music in your household? Well, Mahalia Jackson was one of the top people. Uh, on Sunday morning, we did listen to all of gospel music and Mahalia Jackson was quite an influence, but my dad loved the big band sound. And uh, he would be, there was one of his favorites was called Jumping at the Woodside. And I remember that and it was always. And so that's where Saturday music came in and we bop and bop and bop. And, but on Sunday we listened to gospel music. So I've got, uh, I guess, a kind of a split personality, if you will, about music. <laughs> <laughs> because I've got all of that music. And, and uh, but I love Nat King Cole for his sound and his way of presenting a song. And, and uh, then I would come down to Aretha Franklin with the way she could wail like nobody else could. Mm. And I could I can hear her in my ear all of the time, but also Gladys Knight. Now Gladys Knight, people have said, have three, uh, three notes in her range. But with those three notes, she works those three notes. And I always wanted to sound like Gladys Knight. Gladys Knight is one of my favorite singers. And I will say this with all due respect to all the Barbara Streisand fans out there. Yes. If you have never heard uh, Gladys Knight's version of The Way We Were. Yes, sir. You know, go and listen to it because every time I hear it, um, I, I burst into tears. Uh, yes. She captures every single nuance of that song. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, what was the first live show that you saw uh, that really uh, grabbed you um, outside of hearing music in the church? Let me think. Uh, the first live show that I remember, honestly, and, I, and later on I was in it, uh, was Hair. Remember that show, Hair? Uh, well, of and, course. <laughs> and that is as far from church as you can possibly That's get. Although that's a different type of church. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and uh, I found myself in Los Angeles. I had a, a second, my second oldest sister said, somebody's got to come out to California and see the mountains and then see the ocean and the this and the that. So I dashed out there. And quite honestly, I was 17 years old, just turned 17. And uh, one day I went to an audition for hair. 
And, you know, they were pulling kids off the street at the time. So it wasn't like a big to do, but I auditioned for it. And when it came time to get naked, I just popped off my clothes. I had no reservation about doing that. <laughs> Wait a minute. I think I need to tell my mother. <laughs> so, Well, I we have to back up for just a moment. There. <laughs> um, had you auditioned for anything in your life? Um, had you ever thought about being in the business? Had you oh, yes. ever had? Oh, yes. Oh, I always wanted to very much. I always wanted to, but I didn't know how to do that. Uh, when I went to California with Betty, she said, listen, there's a couple of things you must do. You must train. You must train your voice. You must learn to dance. You must do all of these things. So it was, wasn't like I just dashed off the street somewhere. I did have, you know, her there going, okay, let's go. Let's go. You know, let's get training. Let's get training. And thank God for that. Um, because I did have a sense of what I wanted to do, but I, at, when I got to her, I didn't know how. So that was the training. So when it came to auditions, she would look in the trade papers for me and say, you need to go to this audition. Oh, wait, here's another one. Go to this audition. You got to get pictures. You got to get, you know, and I had to think uh, maybe two or three lines on my first resume, you know, and I would sing the same song. I didn't care if I was going for an opera or if I was going for a blues or whatever. I sang, you know, the same song because I didn't know very many songs. So you now was Betty pretty much like a stage mother uh, to you? I mean, was she pushing you? Uh, she obviously knew that you had this gift, uh, but was she really pushing you along? To uh, she believed you in you, obviously. She believed in me, Richard, but she was also an actress, and so it wasn't that she was pushing me so much, except yes, but she also was had done all of those um, kind of TV sitcom things back when, you know, so. She knew this business and she knew also that if I were going to be in this business, I needed to be trained. So there was no sense of competitiveness or anything between you and Betty. No. Uh, no she no. really wanted to show you the ropes. Yes. Yes, That's absolutely. Amazing. Betty didn't sing and we would always make a joke. Sweetheart, you go over there and you do this and I'll sing, <laughs> you know, or whatever. Yeah. So when you went in and you ripped your clothes off yeah. uh, uh, to do hair, uh, was this a professional company? Oh, yes. Yes. It was a company that came out of New York, as a matter of fact. It was one of the companies that came out of New York. And uh, we opened at what was then called the Aquarius Theater. And um, just, but they did pull kids off of the street because at that time uh, they were really sort of looking for that authenticity, if you will. And there were a few of us who had a little more training, but they, they would come and just grab the kids off the street, mainly guys, mainly young guys who would smoke and smoke. <laughs> <laughs> smoke and smoke. <laughs> uh, and did you get your equity card with this production? I did. Okay. I did indeed. And tell us a little bit about what that equity card meant to you at that point in your life. I mean, for those of us who are in the business, getting your equity card my dues, my bill just arrived yesterday. Right. Um, getting, uh, did yours arrive too? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you, getting that equity card is such an important thing uh, in this business. Uh, it's the holy grail for you. Yes. Um, was it a blessing or a hindrance to you? Uh, it was never so early right. in your career. Right, exactly. No, it's never been a hindrance. Uh, it was a blessing to me because I understood uh, what it meant to be covered in a sense of um, not getting strung out somewhere in Iowa and not having the proper breaks uh, during a production, the proper uh, food, time allowed for food, time allowed for shoes. We didn't have to wear someone's secondhand shoes. Uh, that was a big thing. Uh, and uh, also just being of course, paying dues, but being covered, I think, just covered uh, emotionally that there was someone to call if things were going awry, you know? So it meant that to me, and it still does quite a, quite a lot. It still does. That's great. And after you got your, uh, after you auditioned, yes. how long after the audition did you find out that you had been cast in the show? That day. Oh, wow. Yeah, that day. Really, seriously. I mean, when... I, when I went to the Aquarius Theater that day, there was a line that was out the door. 
And, you know, I didn't have music. I didn't have a resume. I didn't have any of that stuff. I just knew that they were casting for a show called Hair, You Need to Go. And in line, we laughed and talked and giggled and grinned and you get in and they say, okay, well, um, do you sing? Yes, I sing. Sing something. Okay, so I sing something. Uh, all right, hang on. Just go over there and take a seat in the Aquarius Theater and sat down and, and probably took about, oh, I guess two or three hours of just mm -hmm. sitting around and maybe, you know, having a cup of coffee and laughing some more with people and just meeting and all of that. And then they say, okay, can you come back tonight and see the show? It's like, yes, I, I can, I guess. And I went back that night to see the show. And seriously, the next day they threw us in. It was just, just go wow. in. And you of know, course, they it, was huge, it, it was a huge phenomenon on Broadway. It, it was. changed the face of Broadway at the time. Yes. Um, were you aware of the cultural impact that Hera was making at the time that you auditioned for it? No, not at all. I didn't know what it all meant. I didn't know what to expect. Um, I just knew I was getting ready to do a show with a bunch of fun people. And, and, and you know, to run through the audience and say, you know, come on down to, you know, and all of that stuff. So it was all so new to me. But uh, in years since, I, I understood the impact. And you're also very young at the time as well. Yes. Uh, but I mean, when you came home and you told Betty that you had been cast in a show, yes. did she realize the cultural impact no. of the show that you've been cast in? No. Betty taught school. Uh, bless her. She she taught school because well, that was what that. my family did. Everybody in my family taught school except me. I ran in the opposite direction of doing that. But Betty taught school and uh, and she would go and do her plays at night. I would go with her because she wouldn't leave me at home alone uh, mm -hmm. I, because I was her young sister and if something happened to me, my mother would kill her. So... Uh, <laughs> So I had to go everywhere she went. So I went to her rehearsals for plays that she did. I went to acting classes for classes that she did. And that was where I got involved. And she kept saying, you got to learn, you got to learn, you have to train, train, train. And and that's what I did. So well, God bless her. Yes, God bless her. Seriously, God bless her. Because she didn't have the understanding of theater so much as I began to get more in it. She got more into doing a few television shows and teaching school. Well, it takes a certain type of a confidence, uh, not only to go at 17 years old to be in a show where you are exposing yourself on so many levels. Um, oh. <laughs> were, you, uh, were you comfortable for Betty to come and see the show at that time? And how? And if so, how long did it take for her to come see the show? Did she come immediately to see the oh. show? Oh sure, sure. She came right away, and that's when she's. That's when we both said, "I think we better tell mother," you know, because she <laughs> she wasn't very much older than I, you know. Okay. And so she said, "I think we better tell mother." So I called mother and I said, "Mother, I'm in a show," and she said, "Oh, good. What is it about?" And I told her, and I said, "And I get naked behind the scrim." She said, "Hold on a minute, I'll be right out." And she came out. <laughs> from, she came out from Florida. Seriously. In a day or so, she was out there. She came, she saw the show. She said, well, that's not so bad. You can stay in it. Because good for she, her. Yeah, good for her. Because had she said, no, this is not going to work for me, then I would not have done it. You know, And I don't wow. know where that would have led me. Do you, you know what I mean? Wow. Yeah. Well, so, it was meant to be. It was meant to be. Uh, how long were you with the show? Oh, I think about a year or so. And then... Yes, about a year. And um, I'd like to know, I mean, this was your first major show. You get your equity yes. card with this show. Yes. What are the life lessons that you learned from that show um, that have carried you through the rest of your career, uh, both as an actress uh, and as, uh, as a human in this business? Uh, what are the lessons you learned? Because obviously this sets the tone and paves the way for the future. It did, Richard, and it's going to sound probably corny here again, but 
it was a real belief in, in myself, believing that I had the ability to do what I saw other people do. There were, Kay Cole came out of that show, and that's a name that goes back a while. She held the, the queen spot in that show mm -hmm. for a very long time. And I saw them doing those things, and I had always been told that I was a good singer. My mom and my mm -hmm. dad both, they said, yes, do your life, do whatever it is you want. But sometimes when people say that and then they see you doing it, they're not really clear that that's what they meant, you know, for you to do your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I, I looked at them and I, and I heard these phenomenal singers and I thought to myself, well, I can do that. And, and I trained, I did, I went and had voice classes and I, with Lee and Sally Sweetland who lived in Los Angeles and they were voice coaches and Betty again said, you gotta train, you have to know what you're doing, you have to do. And I went to Lee and Sally Sweetland and they honestly gave me my belt voice. They, mm -hmm. they understood how to tell me to belt my voice without losing my voice. And that's that took training, and um, it well, was just I want to I want to tip my hat uh, to Betty once again because first of all, seventeen years old, in a show like Hair, yes. um, you know, you could have gone in any direction. Let's face it, mm -hmm. um, at that point, but the discipline that you had, I mean, did you learn that discipline early on? Uh, I'm sure that after the show, you went home, you were very disciplined. You have to learn the discipline of your body, yes. your voice, yes. uh, your psyche. All of yes. that has to come together. Absolutely. Yes, you're right. And yes, I did. I have never been the kind of person who likes to hang out that much. I don't drink. Uh, I did smoke, but I thought, you know, if I want to sound, and please forgive me, but if I want to sound like Suzanne Plachette, uh, <laughs> whose voice deepened so heavily, and I, I didn't want to do that, so I thought I better give up the, the cigarettes. So I gave that up early on, thank God, and uh, and kept training. And I I don't hang out very often. And to this very day, I mean, I like the comfort of my home. I like my quiet time. Uh, I like my nieces and nephews and my family mm -hmm. and a few friends, and I can call it. That's great. Um, I want. What were the circumstances uh, towards at the end of the show? Uh, did the show just close, or uh, did you decide to move on? Uh, what were the reasons that you left the show at the end of its run? It closed. It did okay. close. Uh, I think that uh, it had made its way across the country, and I believe that it was just about time for it to really just sort of see its way to the end. Uh, but it had had a great run in New York, from what I understand. I never saw it in New York. was not mm -hmm. involved with it there. But we did a wonderful, wonderful production. And when it was time to go, it just it closed. Now, when the show closed, where did you find yourself? Did you uh, stay in Los Angeles? Did you come to New York? Uh, and I also want to talk about Delray Beach, uh, which is your home base now. Uh, West and how, yes, and how you ended up there. Yes. Well, uh, I did not uh, go to New York right away. I stayed in Los Angeles and learned more about how to sing with a band. I had a very dear friend who was a, uh, a producer, record producer, and he and his wife and I became very good friends. I went to work with Diane Cannon. Do you remember Diane? Oh, yes, of course. Diane had a, a show. And we, three girls, three of us, auditioned the same day for that show. And we talk about that even now, that mm. Diane was, um, she was not a great singer, but she could put across a song like a lot, like nobody's business. She could really do that. And she, she has the and, greatest laugh in the world. I know. She throws her head back and she just <laughs> laughs. Love her for that because my dad was the same way. And I, that's what I do too. But she just became a very good friend. And we toured and we worked in San Francisco and and a lot of the clubs at that time were 
really big and they were, um, what do you call it? They were uh, franchises. So we would go from one to the other and from one to the other. And that's how I moved along uh, with, uh, you know, one show to the next and one show to the next like that. So, no, I didn't go to New York right away. I didn't go to New York until quite a bit later, actually. Avery, they did you like, like, excuse me, but did you like being on the road? I didn't know what it meant to not be on the road or yes or no. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it was fine. It was okay. fine uh, for at that time. And then I sort of stayed put for a while in Los Angeles. And uh, and then recently, actually, I call it recently, but it was a few years ago now, I, I did do The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas with, uh, with Ann Margaret. With Ann Margaret, which I want to talk about as well. Yes. So, yeah, that was the coming back around to doing it as I matured, I understood how, how much I liked it. Uh, and you also became uh, Diane Cannon. I mean, she's also became good friends with uh, Burt Reynolds. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Reynolds and I share a birthday. Okay. Uh, 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 speaking of the age of Aquarius, we're both Aquarians <laughs> and uh, <laughs> all this synergy going on. Yes. Um, how did you and Burt Reynolds originally meet? Because you became very good friends and he became a mentor of yours. You worked at his theater. Um, you uh, spoke at his funeral. Um, you, how did that friendship begin for you? I was doing a show called Whose Life Is It Anyway? with Gary Berghoff at, at Burt Reynolds Theater. Mm -hmm. And he was on the West Coast a lot. He came in uh, one night and I was when uh, Charles Nelson Riley was my director, whom I, I just, I could, I, I could just munch on him. He was so wonderful. And he would call me the actress because I was just not that good, but he would call me the actress. He says, you're a singer, but you're gonna be an actress here. You're gonna be an actress. Don't worry about it, you'll be fine. So I said, okay. But uh, Bert came in one night and uh, he had a, a class. He would do a class when he came in, whether it was one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock, whatever, it didn't matter. He was gonna have a class. And he had a class and he came in and I sat there mesmerized by this person who I had heard about, but had never met. And he was, he was very nice, but he was very firm about what he wanted from his class. And, and uh, so he came in and he did the class and then the next day he came to the rehearsal and he just sort of um, decided that I was someone that he wanted to mentor. And he brought in, later on, and this I have to double back, the summer after Whose Life Is Anyway, the stage manager asked me, had I ever done Dream Girls? And I said, no, I didn't know the show. I didn't, I'd never done it. He said, well, Bert wants to do it for you. I was like, okay, what does that mean? He says, well, he wants you to do Effie White. And I said, okay. Well, you know, when things happen and I guess they're supposed to happen, regardless to whether you know the ins and outs or whatever, that's how life is. It throws things at you and you can either hit that ball, punt, back up or whatever. And, uh, you know, there again, I just said, okay, all right. I love the fact that he said that he wants to do it for you instead of saying it, he wants to do it with you. No, no, he said for me. I love that. I, yeah. I, that's great. Yes. He said he wanted to bring that show in for me. I, I didn't know what that meant, but I must tell you, Richard, it was not the easiest thing because, um, and, and I don't want to put a damper on your show, but there were some people who were not very nice. They were not. They were not very kind. They came off the road. They uh, didn't know me from Adam. Uh, they didn't expect that I was going to be doing that role. Uh, I had to sort of really learn to do what I call now, fight my way through. I had to fight my way through. And from what I understand on opening night, he had some people there from CBS and I can remember his box was right up there. And he, they told me, he was saying, you see, I told you she could do it. Didn't I tell you she could do it? She could do it. The next day is when he asked me to do B.L. Stryker, which was his TV show. Mm -hmm. And so Providence is what I think. You know, it's, that's life. Well, 
I'm glad you brought up that aspect of it. My shows are about celebrating, but we do, are in a business where there are people out there. They're in every corner. I mean, just this week alone, I had two very close friends, they may be watching now, who dealt with snipers in the grass, people who are out to get you, who will say negative things about you in this business. Mm -hmm. um, they're there. We deal yeah, with they, them daily. Um, what got you through it? I'm sure your faith had a lot to do with it, but what yeah. gets you through these negative aspects of it? I, my sisters and my mom and my family, uh, and uh, and and it's kind of brings me now to full circle because I am the last of my siblings that are all mm -hmm. everyone else has passed away. My mom and dad do, but my family. Uh, and fortunately, I was here uh, in South Florida at home when all of these things happened. And I would talk with my oldest sister who just passed away, and she would say, "You know what? It's about timing. Don't worry. It's all about timing. It, if mm -hmm. it's yours, you will do it." And if it's not, it won't work. Are it you listening, Tess? This is what Tess says to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, it just won't, it won't work, you know. So, and, and it's very true. And Tess and I talk a lot and we talk about these kinds of things too. And it's, it's just very true. And I've learned over the years to really hang on to that. Yes. That's, that's something that gets me through now. Um, because I do find myself wondering what am I supposed to continue to do in my life, you know, uh, as I mature? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I can answer that for you. Continue being Avery Summers because you're the best you that you can possibly be. Absolutely. That's it right there. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. And that's something that I hooked into a long time ago. I would always say, if you want a good Avery Summers, call me because I'm the one. That's great. Yeah. I want to talk about two people, I mean, we're talking about Burt Reynolds. A lot of people think of Burt Reynolds as this guy who was always, you know, a jokester, a fun guy, but he really loved the business. Oh, he yeah. loved the craft. Yes. He had his own theater. Yes. Um, he really worked hard with actors such as yourself. Um, tell us a little bit about the Burt Reynolds, the man that a lot of people don't know about and his uh, generosity of spirit, uh, because I know a lot about that side of him that a lot of people don't know about. Mm -hmm. Well, you're absolutely right. He loved this business. He loved teaching. He loved his students. Uh, and he would make that trek from Los Angeles to South Florida, to his theater, where people would clamor to have a class with him at three o'clock in the morning. I don't care what they were doing or where they had been. If Mr. Reynolds was coming in, we we're going to class because he would just drop little gems of things that he knew about. He had been through, he had experienced those things, but he was just uh, for me as a person, he really kind of handheld me through a lot of things that I would not have known, especially about tele television, because he would say, hey, you see this, see this light, see that? Look through there, that's what, that's what this does. This, if you look this way, you do that. I mean, he really taught me that. And when I say mentor, mm -hmm. I really mean that. And I know that everybody does, but for me, he mentored me. He mentored me, he, I, he was the kind of person I would call and say, I don't quite understand what this means or what that means. Well, honey, in my life, I, re I it has happened that I knew this and I know that. And, and he had a few people in his life that he was really close with. Dom DeLuise, you know, those guys, they, they were guys together and they <laughs> laughed and they told jokes and they made pasta and they ate and they <laughs> ran. <laughs> and, and then, you know, there were the, the other people who just were, unfortunately, hangers on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, people, there are those people. Uh, but I considered myself one of those guys that he would, you know, take and, and we talk about all kinds of things. He would take me, when we were doing BL Striker, he would take me to what was known as his honey wagon. <laughs> and, and we would talk <laughs> about the day, <laughs> we would talk about the day shoot, about what we were going to do and what was coming up that day or whatever. And then we would talk about life, just about life, about mm -hmm 
uh, people and how they could be unpleasant and everything. And, and he would reiterate, don't worry about those people. They're not going to be around anyway. They just won't. They won't be in your life to either enhance it or not. So mm -hmm. just don't worry about that. Just keep doing good things, doing the things that you know are the right things for you to do and move on, you know, so, right. yes. And I also want to talk about Charles Nelson Riley because he was a consummate director. Yes. Uh, a lot of people don't know that about him uh, because of his comedic nature and yes. everything. What did you learn about him as a director uh, and what was he able to bring out of you as a director? Well, first, let me just la let me laugh a little bit about Charles. And he would say this all the time. He had that old black cap that looked like a, a captain's cap that he would wear on his head. And he would come in every day to rehearsal and say, and then he would start to tell us jokes and he would start to tell us stories and he'd start to tell us everything like this. And so for 30 minutes or so, we would all sit, you know, just wide eyed and couldn't get enough of the stories that he would tell. And then he would say, people, please, you're wasting my time. Come on. You should finish it. <laughs> I still laugh just like a crazy person about that because that's something that I love. But he would take his time and explain why he wants you to go here or there or why I think it's the better place for you to end up. Ask your question here. Or when I was trying to say something to Gary Berghoff about what he was doing in that bed and I was his nurse and he would say, yell at him like this, you know, or whatever. And I would say, really like that? He said, yeah, just like that. And I would do it and then I thought, okay, yeah, that makes sense you know, and it was nothing that was out of the ordinary, but it was the ordinary made big, made into something, you know, and that's, and I teach now, Richard, I really do. And I teach now, um, and I can hear Mr. Reynolds in my head and I can hear Charles in my head, the things that I try to impart to my students. And I am thrilled that I've got them in my head. Well, that's exactly where I was going to go next. Uh, as they say, if you become a teacher by your students, you'll be taught. What are you taught by your students? My students look at me now, and, and I think they think sometimes that I do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they do know that, feel that way. Uh, but they will eventually come to me at the end of a class, and they'll say, this was good. I got, I got a lot out of this tonight. Or may I ask you a question? And they'll ask and they'll say, yes, now I understand. Because I like to be able to give them the opportunity to find the answer. I don't want to give them every answer. Find it, work through it, fight through it to get to the place where I think that you really want to go when you're doing this part, you know? So, I think that they feel that I can, I've been able to impart some, some good information. Well, what do you feel is the greatest piece of advice that you've been given in this business? Oh, that's, uh, that's difficult. I, I, I don't have an answer that uh, can be a, a set answer. There are many things that I've learned over the years, but um, stick to um being the, continuing to be the me that I am, to not let anyone knock me off of my course. I mm -hmm. tell my students all the time to stand still and stay rooted and not to act like a weevil wobble. You know, that thing where you push it and it just goes this way and that way. To stand rooted, stand still, stay firm. And I believe for me, that is what I can answer you with on the short side of the answer. I, anyone who knows me, I always tell everyone, stay in your lane and keep yes. your blinders on. Mm -hmm. Because when I start thinking about what someone else is doing, I am focused on them and not on myself. And Correct. I'm going to get off course. Yes. So uh, very good advice there. Um, so out of, you know, a lot's happened since you threw your clothes off. Uh, doing <laughs> um, the business has changed a lot. Um, yes. Since that moment, uh, what are some of the changes that you absolutely love in this business? And what are some of the things that you really miss uh, about 
what the business was when you first got started? Well, the changes, of course, are talking to you here right now, being able to do this. And, and when you when we talk and say, now you've got to have this, this, and this, and my mind goes, whoa, because I don't really know how to do that. I'm back in the 20th century. I don't really know how to, you know, do very many of those things. Technically, I am really, really at a loss a lot. But, but you I did got, it. But I did it. Uh, <laughs> and yes, God bless her. You know, she walked me through things today as she has done on many occasions. And then I've got these two, um, I've got twin nephews who are 29 years old and they say, oh, well, I'm, all you have to do is to do the da 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 <laughs> And I'm going yeah, like, but just hold on a second, get back to number one, the one for the, let me do the one. And then the two, like, and you know, and of course they're very patient and they smile and they say, okay, auntie, you got it, you know, whatever. But what I love most uh, about that, of course, as I said, is technology. The thing I missed and I still miss for me is it seems that there's very little training going on, very little need to feel that you need to be trained. Now, when I was coming up in this business, and you've heard this, I'm sure, to be a triple threat. And I, nobody is a triple threat anymore. They may not need to be, I don't know. Uh, but there's so much money thrown at young people now without the need to have a, a real grounded background in what they know. When you wake me up at three o'clock in the morning, I know I know how to do this. Kind There's another stuff. layer to this. Um, and I'm not gonna mention her name out of respect to her, but a very well-known person in this business who won a major talent competition uh, years ago, um, landed a major Broadway show. And she missed more performances than she was able to do because she didn't have the discipline That's of correct. doing eight shows a week. Yes. Because she didn't have the training to do that. Yeah. It yeah. takes intense dedication and training to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, and it doesn't happen overnight. No, it um, I want to talk about two other things before we run out of time. And you're doing a show now, and I hope I get the title right, uh, Cocktails and Conversations. Yes. Uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Cocktails and Conversations came out of the fact that I always tell my students that uh, we had Sarah Bernhardt and we don't need another one. And so when we're doing scenes, it's a conversation. It's as simple as that. It's a conversation. Uh, you can color it uh, with anger and with tears and with, uh, you know, all, it, all kinds of ways. And I teach them about Howard Hawks, who was a director back in the 40s. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was rapid fire. Everything was like that, but you understood every single word. And I'm very, very particular about the endings of words and things like that. And I would always say to them, it's a conversation. Don't give me anything else. I don't need big, I don't need this. So Donna and I, Donna Carbone, who is a theater manager there and she owns a theater, um, we talk just about every day. And she said, you know, I think I need to make something out of this because our students, I teach on Monday, Wednesday and Friday and uh, our students, by Friday, they get to choose monologues. And we put the monologues together and make a show for them. Wow. So that this is a, great. Some, yes, something that they can hang their hat on and say, oh, my gosh, I actually have time on the stage. I know how to run the lights. I know how to run the sound. I know where stage, down stage is, stage right, stage left. I know all of these things. And we then put them in shows. So that's how the cocktails part came about. She said, let's make this cocktails and conversations and we will be able to uh, put our students in it. And we're coming up now next week. We start Tech Week and we open next Friday and it's like hit the ground running because there you go. And we've got one 14 year old in the, in the class, one. And uh, I, because I don't teach young kids very often. I, I shy away from it because parents, because school, because all kinds of things. And of course, in this last year, COVID. So it was very difficult. But this young girl was persistent. She would call the theater, have her mother call. I want to be in class. I want to be in class. And let me tell you, she's got the most monologues and she is handling it. So I, I, I think that cocktails and conversation is going to be uh, a joy for everybody to see. And have you thought about doing this virtually or is it just something that you're doing uh, down in uh, Florida? 
I never thought about it virtually. I do not like virtual. I do have to admit that when I was asked about teaching there, which was last May, May of 2020, and things were raging at that time, I told a friend in Los Angeles and he said, oh my God, Avery, don't do that. You can't do that, it's live. And I said, yes, and he said, but it's live. And I said, but I don't want to do virtual. Well, the very moment we opened our doors on May 18th, 2020, we only took eight students because they had to be spaced out. They had to have masks. They had to have hand sanitizers. They had to everything. We have not closed our doors. We have had a backup list of people waiting to get in because people were tired of doing virtual even back then. Well, thank God for that. Yes. And I, you know, and I want to ask. I mean, uh, New York, Los Angeles, London, Chicago, Delray Beach. <laughs> Delray Beach is your home base. Why Delray Beach? Well, first of all, it, it's not Delray Beach. It's West Palm Beach. Okay. And that, and that's a, a quite a big difference. But yes, it is a big difference. <laughs> uh, my family was here. Okay. Uh, my sister who just passed away, my brother who just I'm passed sorry. away, not to go into I'm that. Sorry. But I've got, uh, you know, my nieces and my nephews, my family is here. My sister's home was here, which is where I was until just recently. And I moved out and gave uh, the twins their space because they're grown now and I needed my own space. So West Palm Beach uh, is where I grew up. It's very comfortable. It is home. I have uh, my supermarket, which is Publix. I love my supermarket. I love my Walgreens and CVS. I love my car. I know where I'm going. I know the people I'm going to run into. So, um, yes, this is it's this home. is where I want to be. Yeah. It's home. It's now, home. you know, I end my shows by doing my little homage to James Lipton inside the actor's studio. Oh, yes. Um, and I have uh, a few random questions that I'm going to ask you. Okay. And the first question is, what is the most difficult promise that you have ever had to keep? The most difficult promise that I ever had to keep. Well, it, it it's a little sad, but um, my mom had Alzheimer's and, mm -hmm. uh, and I um, made a promise that I was never going to leave her um, alone. And that was one of her fears was being left alone. And I was living in New York, as a matter of fact, and uh, I had been offered an apartment house uh, to buy that I could have bought, but I did not want to make that commitment because I wanted to be free to come back and forth to Florida to be with my mother. And so that was the hardest um, thing that I ever had to do, but it was the most wonderful challenge to be able to do that. God bless you for that. Yeah. Um what was the slowest realization that you ever came to? That I was enough, that I'm enough. Wow. Uh, it, it, it's, it's very difficult, I think it can be uh, to, I grew up in a family of A types. You know, everybody was an A type, go get them type person. And I'm the last of that four, and my mom and dad were A-type people too. And I never felt that I wasn't, it wasn't that I felt that I wasn't good enough. It's just that I didn't think that I measured up because all I ever wanted to do was sing and they, they could mm -hmm. write and they could do this and they did this and they did five things in the space of an hour. And I did one thing and that was sing. But my sisters both finally said to me, Yes, but you did one thing very well, and we did five things. Oh, you know, wow. so that I wow. that I'm. Well, trust me, you measure up. <laughs> um, when did you take the longest time to reach a destination? A physical destination? Yes. yes. Uh, gosh, the first time I went to Japan to cross the international date line twice. <laughs> I mean, the sun sunrise and then oh my god the sunrise again uh to get to japan but that was quite a trip uh and i'm glad that i went there because it was a, a quite a learning experience for me in every way but travel time going to japan wow um 
what is the hardest question that you have ever answered? Hmm. I don't know. I think the, the hardest question I've ever answered, and it, it's to myself, really, where am I going? What am I doing? Mm -hmm. On a daily basis, what am I doing? Why am I, uh, am I doing something that's going to serve somebody else or, you know, not necessarily myself so much, but to serve someone else. Um, I did not know that I love children, but I do. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm finding out so many things about myself once I've allowed myself to be uh, mature and, and get to that. Uh, and uh, so I love uh, trying to find that out. But I think, you know, just, um, I don't know. That's not an easy question to answer. Not an easy one at all. No. And my last question is, what do you feel is the noblest profession in the world? Oh, dear. You know, I really do think it's teaching. And, and it's so funny that I would say that because as I said at the beginning, I ran in the opposite direction of teaching. But I believe it is. And, and there was a, something I saw not too long ago about teaching. That teachers don't teach for the money. They, it, it, I, and I've forgotten the end of it, but it, it's something that about serving and giving and, uh, and, and seeing the light bulb go on over someone's head or in their eyes when they get it, you know, whether it's teaching a, a little person to, to be able to say their name, understand where they live and that their mommy's name is not mommy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a real name. And then to see the light bulb go off on a teenager's head. In one of my classes just recently, um, this young girl is 20 years old, and I was trying to work with her to get her to understand the text and understand the text. And we'd go up on stage and she would do it. And finally she got, and, she, and I could see her go, oh, I get it. And she did, and she got it. And I'm telling you, it brings me to tears right now to, wow, to see her beautiful. get it, you know, so. I think I just want to ask you one more question. Yes. If you don't mind. No. Who was the one teacher that made the biggest difference in your life? My mom. Great. My mom That's taught me in the first grade, fourth grade, and sixth grade. So she made the biggest impact. And I know I say my family all the time, but she really did. Because oh. after first grade, I was too frightened to go anywhere else. So she said, all right, come with me. Fourth grade, she realized that I needed a really good, solid background in English and math and those things. And sixth grade was when I was going to start changing classes, like junior high school. And she said, I need my child one more time to teach her a few more of the grounding rules before we let her go. And so she grabbed me and taught me, you know, in sixth grade to be able to understand what it was going to mean to do changing classes and hanging on to the things that she taught me as a child. And what was her name? Beatrice. Beatrice Wolf. Yes. God bless you. Don't yes. go anywhere for a moment, Avery. Oh, I want to yes. thank you all for being here today. Um, I don't take it for granted that you could have been anywhere else for the last hour. And I'm sure Avery feels the same way. So Absolutely. thank you so much for being here. Um, again, if this was your first time, my hope is that you will subscribe to Richard Skipper Celebrates. Um, I have interviewed over 300 people. Not interviewed, I've had conversations with over 300 people. And my goal is to celebrate all of them. I believe that everyone has a story to tell. Yes. And I hope that you will check them out. And hopefully there'll be 300, 600, 900 more. And with your help, we will get there. Just subscribe. If you did indeed like today's show, hit the like button. Please leave a comment and share this with your friends. I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and the fifth name that pops up, reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, but a phone call. Yes. And let that person know what they mean to you. Because as my dear friend David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. 
And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. <laughs> so Avery, I'm going to leave the screen right now and I'm going to give you the final word. Anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to anyone who's watching right now, uh, I want to thank you for the gifts that you've given to the world, um, the gifts that you will continue to give. Uh, you don't have to worry about how do I get out of here, because when you say goodbye, I will end the show. I love you. And we don't have to wait three years to do this again. No, I love you. Thank you. No, we don't. I love you too, Richard. And thank you so very much for bringing me on in this time in our lives. Uh, so much has happened over the last year. And I am so grateful to continue to hang on to the relationships and friendships that I've made in this, in this business and in this world in my life. And you are certainly one of those people. And uh, just keep doing what you are doing to enlighten the world. And hopefully I will be able to continue to do the same thing and know it won't take another three years. God bless you all. Thank you very much.